dreaming of owning a property in a prime location with great proximity and fantastic neighborhood, EJ Investments Sanyang Seaview Estate is the best choice you have been waiting for. Our Sanyang Seaview Estate is approximately 15 minutes drive away from the busy hop of Brusubi roundabout and into the heart of nature where you can have a peaceful and relaxed lifestyle with your family. You can buy a finished four bedroom story with five year flexible payment plan or a service plot with two year payment plan plan option. With over 300 homes, you will enjoy big tar roads with covered drainage, modern electrification with solar street lights, gated entrance with security post, and a breath-catching experience of our beautiful sea view and lake view. You can own a home today at our Sanyang Sea View Estate. Call us today on 446-4838 or 325 9220. Visit our website on ejinvestments.net. EJ Investments, first in property. Another beautiful Saturday, and this is the brunch here on Kerfatu with me, Joy and Mama. Today is going to be a special, special edition of the brunch. But before much ado, I'll allow our panelists to uh, introduce themselves. Well, you already know Mr. Lamin Cham, he's from the uh, Standard newspaper, and of course, our very own Mustafa K. Dabo. You're highly welcome to the brunch today. Thank you. Good morning, Joy, and good morning to our viewers across the world. I'm glad to be on the program. Good morning. Yes, we're all glad to be on the program today. So quickly, we'll take Mr. Lamin Chamus from the Standard Newspaper. He will be taking us through all the events that have been happening, especially those that are most trending over the week. Mr. Lamin Cham, what do you have for us? In the newspapers, of course. Um, all right, we will start with um, the inauguration of a new vice president. It's had in just about two and a half years, if you like of the Barrow administration and the tough uh, statements delivered by Barrow, which is seen by many as, uh, uh, you know, as for the first time, his comments on the sacking of uh, former Vice President Dabo and his own former political godfather. We will go back to the Dunes Hotel, as we always do every week, to look at the latest testimonies at the TRRC. That's <coughs> not the first topic we will have. Now, what a seemingly brewing controversy emerged within the week also when State House communication officials um, announced, that is informally, that um, uh, journalists wishing to be accredited to State House will now have to go to a background check by the State Intelligence Services, uh, formerly notoriously known as NIA. Uh, we will bring you updates and reactions of journalists perhaps comments about that and then i think um, when it comes to politics we will uh, look at uh, what the political parties or politicians individuals have been saying since the week that's plus much more if time allows we will talk on the newspaper uh, review uh thank you very much mustafa what well, would you be discussing um on the subsequent time well, on well, Kerfatu website. On our website, we will be discussing key among other issues the the uh, various testimonies that a summary of various testimonies mm -hmm. that have come before the um, the, the commission. Um, of course, the reaction uh, to uh, as Mr. Cham said, we've carried the reactions of International Federation of Journalists to to uh, the request from State House uh, to to get journalists to be screened. Um, there are also a, there is also a report indicating that ten out of um, uh, six out of ten every ten Gambian uh, um, desires to leave the country. I mean, immigrate. Um, we would look at that um, and, and many other issues if time permits. Thank you very much, Mr. Cham. Yeah. You had mentioned earlier that you would be discussing about the Barrow speech. Tell us more. It was quite. You know, interesting seeing that Barrow have come out boldly to say he would not be 
um, uh, take in any, you know, he would not take anything for granted. He would make sure that whoever is serving the Gambia itself, um, the Gambia with utmost good faith. What do you make of this? Yes, I think it is for the first time uh, that the president has come out to talk about uh, the sackings, latest sackings. And he admitted, of course, that uh, it was a difficult decision for him to part with his political uh, godfather, Davo, and the other colleagues in the UDP, with, with whom he worked uh, very closely, mm -hmm. um, who probably might have contributed in his uh, uh, political career. Um, and of course, in some cases, some might argue, facilitated his presidency. Now, he admitted in his speech that, that it was a tough decision he had to make. He also said what he thought that, um, you know, you cannot be in cabinet. Dreaming of owning a property in a prime location with great proximity and fantastic neighborhood? EJ Investments Sanyang Seaview Estate is the best choice you have been waiting for. Our Sanyang Seaview Estate is approximately 15 minutes drive away from the busy hop of Busubi roundabout and into the heart of nature where you can have a peaceful and relaxed lifestyle with your family. You can buy a finished four bedroom story with five year flexible payment plan or a service plot with two year payment plan an option with over 300 homes you will enjoy big tar we apologize for that short break mr lamin chan was definitely telling us his um um his take on uh the barrow's speech yes, yes mr lamin thanks joy welcome back um like i said this was the first time president barrow has said anything um that suggests that he must be talking about the uh, recent sackings in his cabinet mm -hmm. And he admitted that it was a tough decision because, you know, the personalities involved was uh, his own political godfather, lawyer Damo, and colleagues he had worked with uh, who might have, in one way or the other, facilitated his own <laughs> ascendancy to the president. So it was a tough decision he said he had to make. But he said he did it in the interest of the Gambia. And you cannot be in parliament, a uh, cabinet, and uh, you uh, obviously see, seem to be undermining. Uh, the agenda of the government. I mean, he justified, he tried to justify his moves, um, you know, in, in effect in this cabinet reshuffle. And, um, well, it, 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 it left a lot of, uh, it sparked a lot of debates because uh, people who are apparently UDP uh, supporters said, well, the president was wrong. I mean, his agenda was political. That is why he could not you know, be on the same place with Davo and others if his agenda had always remained national interest. And because Mr. Davo had uh, have been quoted many times that his supporters and every Gambian should follow the national interest. Um, but then perhaps according to critics of Barrow, he probably have, um, uh, he had mixed his political agenda with the NDP and other agendas in the government. And that is why he was not on the same plate with Dabo and others. Uh, that's what the critics of Barrow, um, apparently UDP to support us, are saying. But what is important is Barrow um, had also said to the incoming cabinet, that um, the cabinet members, Vice President, that he looked forward for them to deliver um, just for the interests of the country and be free from political considerations. But again, his critics said he himself must start from himself by freeing himself from all political maneuverings if he really want to get his team to concentrate purely on national mass. What do you think of that? Well, uh, <clears throat> this is a very uh, difficult statement to analyze in the, in the sense that it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's politically charged. Mm -hmm. And depending on which side of the divide you sit, mm -hmm. you see it from a different, different vantage point. Now, when the president speaks, he was speaking from his own side, mm -hmm. um, seeing others who intend to take his position. Position he he remember this is a guy who claims who analogizes mm -hmm. status as some guy who had hunt, hunted a lion, killed a lion, and cannot therefore give that lion's right. meat to someone else. Uh, that's the analogy he used to. to to, to interpret his current situation. Mm -hmm. So judging from his standpoint, he has won a trophy mm -hmm. and he cannot hand over that trophy to a second party. Mm -hmm. And from that perspective, you would see that anybody who seemed to have political ambition that could take that trophy from him mm -hmm. 
is seen to be, uh, for, the, for want of a better word, uh, an enemy, a political adversary, if you like. So um, if you judge it from that perspective, yes. Uh, but if you look at it from the side of the orders as well, mm -hmm. um, Hussein Udabo was a political leader, mm -hmm. um, even after at the time of the appointment of his appoint his appointment is a political leader. Um, so naturally, you expect him to be leading his political party, mm -hmm. and his political party has an agenda to form the next government. Mm -hmm. So naturally, it is normal that you expect him to be involved in partisan affairs. Mm -hmm. um, um, and, and if you look at it again on the other side, mm -hmm. Barrow's statement that uh, patriotism is actually being loyal to the commander-in-chief. Mm -hmm. That's in order. That's true. Mm -hmm. uh, but but mm -hmm. then again... Loyal to the state? Or no, yeah, the because the state and the commander-in-chief are supposed it's to supposed be the same. To, yeah. It's the agenda of the state that's supposed to be the agenda of the commander-in-chief. Yeah. But this is not always the case. Yes, yes. Now, when the commander-in-chief's agenda becomes something else, mm -hmm then it becomes an obligation to, 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 to betray the commander-in-chief or to not follow the commander-in-chief. Because in that case, following the commander-in-chief is treason. Now, because it, it, we've seen scenarios where leaders have become danger to their own nation. Now, so, so that's also in order. So that's why I said, depending on which vantage point you are, yeah, it's a difficult are, statement. If you are a neutral person, you want to know, was the board of contention between him and Dabo and company had to do with Davo and companies undermining his national agenda, or Davo and company not agreeing to his political agenda. So I would say that uh, let's first say Was that he not masking his yeah, of course, political yes. agenda uh, that, that is true. In, in the national agenda. That is true, uh, but but of course we have to I, look at it from another perspective, which is uh, the confrontation between Davo and Barrow was unhealthy and mm -hmm. was. Not in the interest of the country. It was. Yeah. It was. It was. It was. It yeah, was. Yeah. It but, was in the interest of the country that one has to go. But you have to go but, to the but, fundamentals. But, but the, the argument, fundamental was the argument and principles on national matters or political matters. No, it was on purely on political basis. So that's very uh, because the difference between Barrow and UDP it itself on is matters. it's it on political basis. Yeah, right. So UDP is saying we can't back you beyond five years, yeah. and Barrow is insisting he must be back beyond five years. This so, is the so this is the Mr. this is the bone of contention. So Mr. Said, there is no he, policy so issue. If, if Mr. Barrow said uh, this, he's suggesting to say that these people have been sacked because they would not agree to his national agenda. Is, is he telling the truth? Uh, well, I was, mean, was he's that, the commander in chief. I wouldn't say he's not telling the truth, but I think it's a, it's it's a, um, it's a, for want of a better word. Um, for example, uh, I he was not. I, I can he was, remember a time when lawyer Dabo spoke against state institutions or policies regarding this or this. I've never had him make observations about how institutions are or, or how the security reform should be or how TRS is. I've never had Mr. Deeper said how these things have been. I've never had some of uh, Mr. Sane said how these no, things have been. No, their fight has so completely see, been political. I've never had, the government will have never had policy differences yeah. within the cabinet. No, there wasn't so, a so, policy difference, so, but, so, but you have to understand. So it looks to the government people yeah. that probably these people did not agree on their political agenda. That's, yes. that's, that's, what, that's what led to their fall apart. That's what led to the fall apart. It's, ah, it's purely the political. Process. Yes, it's purely okay. political. Right, let's go back to the TRRC. Uh, I mean, these latest revelations we had, uh, particularly one that uh, really uh, moved me, is about the plight of the widows. Um, Lieutenant Basiru Baro, Lieutenant Gibral Say, Lieutenant Dotpal, their widows were at the commission and they made very moving uh, revelations. Now, how do you think the TRRC? Should this now mean that reparations, as, as Mr. Kemes and Jambe said, should be privatized uh, above everything else? Because if you look at the testimony of the widows, you, 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 you can perhaps feel that um, they've never had a peace of mind since their loved ones were killed 24 years ago. So it's a, it's a very difficult situation. Now, if you want to understand that there is no there is no way one can understand their pain. There isn't a way. There are certain things that you must leave in order to understand. Because no one understands the pain of a woman who saw her husband walk through the door one night, never to come back again. 
sitting down and counting days and nights, expecting that he is somehow miracle is going to work and he is somehow going to walk through the door, say I'm here. And you are talking about two decades. So there is no amount of words to express that pain or no amount of consolation to take that away. Mm. And if you look at the burden that that society shoulders, like a, a single mother raising a family, struggling uh, from here and there, and with all that, uh, the state that itself puts her in that position refused to acknowledge her pain, let alone help her. Of course, I think it's ideal that TRC reaches out, but you know you will also understand the stand position of TRC as it is right now. Uh, having adequate resources to deal with reparations right now is not bad. Not you know, so this is also a good question. But in the meantime, the, I know that the TRC has in few cases started helping some few people who are going to school. Yeah. People who have complications paying their school fees and they're trying to do it in their own modest ways and while they, while, they, while they wait for yeah. reparations. I think one way also citizens could take ownership of this TRRC. Mm. Citizens, mm. And various Gambians could take ownership and see that TR can even crowdfund for TRRC. Yes. Well, like they, they did, did, least, like they did in the case of Mafu. They could, they, we could take it upon ourselves, even but people who are working with them, to, to, not... to contribute, say, 1,000 or 2,000. To, to, and put it like together for, for various did. witnesses. Yeah, but then is, is it not? Uh, um, is this not uh, really mandatory on the side of the officials of the, of the TRC, particularly? Absolutely. To come out and say, well, yes, they said that this not these are no reparations, but you are suggesting that they don't even have the money yet. Even though. the money is not there for TRC. So what happened to all the money currently... we have in the, uh, the UN gave to transitional justice? Well, that we split. You, you have to understand the TR, the TRRC process is, is so expensive and money goes to different aspects. And TRRC, it, it, what we see, TRRC is just a tip of what an iceberg. What we see is uh, people talking. Yeah. But what happened behind, but what the, happened behind the, the scenes is just too much. Programs, you want to have outreach programs, you want to have reconciliation meetings, you want to have investigation teams on every places you want to you have how many employees does the yeah, investigation are, team have the all salary this. in itself is too much so but there are a lot of works that if you are saying that you are doing this on behalf of people to arrive at justice and conclusion mm -hmm. and then those people are sitting waiting while a lot of money has been spent on getting to where Final results will be then uh, people will do ironies so, and say to draw so, ironies. So you would say, see, you why don't you deal as chemists? Oh, yeah. no, no. So you would see. But it must have established something. Yeah. Possible. So you will see that even the establishment of the truth, it's, it's in some it's way a reparation. Because, because these people, like I said, they've lived with the pain. They've never rest. They've had a restless life for two decades. You don't know who killed your husband, how he died. What were his last words? Where is he buried? You don't know. Yeah. You have no idea. You live with that pain for two decades. In fact, at some point, you began to have conflicting stories. Yeah. Like in the case of uh, Lieutenant Basilu Baro, the two readers who come, they have at some point conflicting stories. Some yeah. people come and tell them that Mr. Baro did not die. No, and they I had to go on. No, uh, well, you know, so, so if you have that kind of case yeah. and you have TRRC helping you to establish right. that in fact he died, and that, this are his last words. I even remember yeah. someone saying when Basil Barrow was approached, uh, Mr. Lieutenant, uh, Mr. Um, uh, uh, Mendy said mm -hmm. when Basil Barrow was approached, he said, Lai, 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 Muhammad Rasulullah. At least the wife could go to bed knowing that this is the last, this were perhaps the last words of my husband. In fact, the case of Basil and Dutfal were uh, largely publicized, were known because yeah. they jointed themselves, uh, admitted that some soldiers lost their life and in the immediate after March, uh, it was it became clear. But the manner in which they died, and Barra, the manner was not known. But then the, the likes of say, uh, Kamara, you know, Fafanyang, and all the rest, those ones remain a mystery until uh, uh, I mean, people started, people, began yeah, to people started licking them on the internet, and then yes, you are, you are right. The TRC testimonies come to confirm them. Yeah, absolutely. So that, that was that, that was that was something else. But then, you know, you could see the, from the November 11 case to the 1995 June case, Korosise, I mean, the last two witnesses we were talking about, how they were, they are trying to draw a scenario that's similar to the narration, uh, narrative of um, Kanye. Yeah. Um, 
you know, they said they, 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 they were drawn away from their regular postings at the Yankuba Tourist Compound. Right, sent on a wild good case. A wild good case, a fake assignment, yeah. so that they, they would not know what, they seem to be suggesting, so that they wouldn't know what transpired in Yankuba Spring. How credible, or, or what sort of beef do you think if there's any they've given to Kanye So, So, you know, I mean, two people testified, they have conflicts in their narrations. The first one is Mr. Amadou Jangam, who was the commander of the guards at that place, testified that Mr. Esa Mendy was not with them on the patrol. There were three. Mr. Esa Mendy said he was with them on the and patrol. The team was larger than that they, dif- they had differences. But where they all agreed yes. is that the guards at the Yakuba's house where we drawn from we are actually sent on that wild good case, right. wild goose mm-hmm. case, mm-hmm. while this incident yeah. happened. So, they, so it was only after information came out that this in particular incident happened that the pieces of the puzzle began yeah, falling, before, yes. began falling before. And then, they got and to then uh, yeah, how only then, why? yeah, did they put together mm-hmm. that this must have been the reason why we were sent we out of combat? Because it. remember, uh, Mr. Jangam says when they even came back. Yankuba who sent them on a mission Sorry. as crucial as people full of guns with boats full of guns landing shore in Gambia mm-hmm. at a time of the transition that would have mm-hmm. sent some some like, like terror in the heart of the junta. So what, what they, they they didn't even ask them what what the mission went, how the mission went, mm-hmm. what happened, mm-hmm. why they came back. Yeah. They came back and they asked to return again. Remember, yes. Jangam said when they came back, they found Edward at Yakuba's house smoking, smoking. With, with mud all over his shoes and, and, and with a wet shirt. Yeah, yeah. And he asked them to go back. go back. So, apparently, what we saw was that they were at ease with themselves. themselves. That suggests that at least, I mean, if they were at ease with themselves, and yet the, 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 there, is, there is a boat full of guns landing ashore with yeah. enemy combatants. I mean, the, the, the irony the, is just... You would have shown the... the it's it's unacceptably... Yeah. But what does this do to the testimony of, well, some of the accounts that Yankuba actually panicked and tried to stop the execution, uh, you know, at his, at his house? To some narratives said that Yankuba might have been present, but he was trying to stop Edward and Peter from executing. Well, now actually, well, this these well, guys were supposed to say that he actually knew the, the fake assignment. Look, uh, the the thing is, whether Yakuba panicked or not, he's if proven mm-hmm. the way narrations are going, he's accessory to murder. Okay. To yeah, because mean? because in the first place, uh, this is this is a guy who has based on the testimonies we have had, pre- who had a prior thought of what was to happen mm-hmm. because you knew that your house would be used you moved your wife and family Excellent. you moved the security guards yes it's premeditated yeah so so you prepare the ground for the murder to happen okay. so the murder, so you cannot come to claim that i uh, so the murder uh, if, if trs testimonies are anything to go by yeah so 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 let's 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 see what the TRS will come out. Uh, I mean, on the November 11, they seem to still have not exhausted anything. Uh, so yeah, because anything. because Yakuba is mentioned um, adversely, and, and adversely obviously so by TRS act, he will be served. We understand Edward they have will been be served. served. Yes, we understand that. Sad, uh, served. Orders will be served. So, what kind obviously. of testimony would you expect from Yankuba Edward if they are supposed to appear? Sana Savali, for example, if they are supposed to appear either by. Uh, it's going to be a complex one, isn't it? Because if you look at it, um, would he come and, and acknowledge that he did it? When, when, when um, he would be confronted by the council or the commission that there have been a lot of testimonies who said you did it. How would they go? Yeah, yeah and, the, and also the, the patterns in the narratives. Yeah. I mean, when you, when you because, because what, what every, every, Commission member may come and lie, yeah. but at least anybody who follows all of us that follows every testimony before the commission, and did you see a pattern? And under, you gather an understanding that at least so, everybody so comes with, with a piece of the puzzle. So the witnesses so, may lie, but at least the at least still yes, at, the, at least yes. When you when you put all yes, some yeah. foul play had 
happen in chorus effect. Absolutely. And when you do that, mm -hmm. you can seem to exonerate Yaakuba. Yeah. So clearly, I doubt if he will come and deny complete knowledge. It will be difficult. But he can come and give a story, a story that, try to that seems it. to absorb him. Such as Koli, Koli try to do. Yes. But it will be ridiculous to come and say, I don't know I, I, anything I about it. Oh, that oh, wouldn't even oh, oh. sound logical. Now, moving on, uh, you had this Gambia hit, what was it called? The corruption allegations that have been recently published. Organized crime. Organized crime in the Guardian, etc. Which now suggests that perhaps Jambe stole almost a billion, a dollars. billion dollars. And when you talk about a billion dollars in Gambian times, times, what do we mean? We mean about... Um, we are simply we're talking, talking about, about the GDP of the country. Absolutely. Yes, so to speak. Yeah. And they've broken this, uh, uh, I mean, these findings into sections. One dealing with how petroleum money was used, one piece alleged, uh, how to call it, gates. Uh, businessmen with a picture there, they were named out with accomplices. Mm -hmm. And the other one, how he obtained an aeroplane uh, through the funds of the Gambian pensioners. Uh, mm -hmm. All this uh, were highlighted in, in, in one big story. Mm -hmm. So, how do you react to this? Um, though, it, for me, it may not sound new, but uh, it, it, it's really, really well. It's not new. Uh, we know it's not new. Um, we know that uh, the, the design information that was before the TRRC. Um, and yeah. judging by Jambe's own lifestyle, you knew that. Uh, this guy could not simply have been limited to his own salary and um, uh, his salary and his the per diems he gets and the benefits he gets. Um, we know how much a president is paid. In the Gambia, at the time of Jambe, a president is paid 175000 yeah, uh, What this report is actually uh, so, explained in detail, well, just as your commission was attempting to do, mm -hmm. how these monies were seafood, the various crafty means, mm -hmm. you know, and the How various the people he used. Yeah, the various people he used on this thing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of so a very intelligent person um, who was able to manipulate um, institutions and people to get his to get to get his uh, you know to get his wealth. Well, uh, well, all thieves are intelligent. Uh, it, it takes a special kind of intelligence to do what Jambe did here. But also, Jambe was also some guy who is taken for granted. Uh, this is a guy who appeared on the scene and people who were supposed to confront and stop him thought he was a fool. This is a guy who is from grade 9, 29, year 12, 29 years old. He has no idea what he's doing. Uh, like they are doing to many others. Uh, you cannot appoint someone, make him the most powerful man in the country, give him all the resources he needs, give him all the state machinery, and then come to think that he is a fool. He looks at you as you are a fool. And in fact, you are the fool. Yeah, absolutely. Because you are the one who don't really know what you are doing. So this is a guy who was taken for granted, mm -hmm. you know. But everybody knew. I mean, he was in charge of the state. Uh, we knew social security and all that. We knew Jambe takes interest in every atom that drops absolutely. in this country. This one, yeah. And he, 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 he is in. He was in charge. And he made sure he got control of everything. Yeah, and you know he had military people who were in charge who. Yeah, I mean, the likes of uh, Mr. Sol, uh, you know, I mean, so so these things are not necessarily a surprise. We, I mean, it's now been, you know, a lot of details have come out when Janet Commission started, but which we will discuss with our guests. Yes, so, yes. Yeah. But, now, but, um, finally, of course, we just because um, the, the group who called themselves Bring Jambe to Justice, this is on, on human rights matter, not... Yeah, Jambe to Justice matter, campaign. Yes. Recently, one of them, one group of them, that's the Trial International, who conducted that uh, very interesting um, investigations into one particular case, the deaths of uh, West African nationals in the country, have come mm -hmm. to say that now, more than ever before, there is a possibility that prosecuting Jambe will be realistic because, much importantly, both the Ghana, Ghanaian and Gambian governments have now strongly pledged that they are ready to go and open press investigations, especially this particular Ghanaian one, you know. Um, and now the things with the TRRC also coming, the picture is now clearer, uh, that many people will hit the court to prosecute them. So basically, that drove her to 
conclude that perhaps now there is ever more realistic um, uh, hope or reality that uh, prosecutions can be brought against Jamie. Did you? Is he? Do you think this possibility is still far fetched? Even though no, I, I think it's necessary. Uh, Jamie has been protected by uh, the president of Victoria. Yeah, I, I think it's necessary. I've always hold the view because there is always a there is always a, a soft landing. I've always hold the view that for Gambia as it is right now, yeah. with the resources it has, uh, the political will that is increasingly but slowly dazzling away. But this, this we could, this, we could, we could rely on now, only yeah, international yeah. goodwill, mm -hmm. only international goodwill yeah. to prosecute Jambe. And that is this case. That's the opportunity this case offers. Yes, that is the Ghanian, so, the with the Ghanaian behind yeah. this case, Ghana is almost next to the, the regional superpower, yeah. Nigeria. Yeah. Um, they have the resources. They have the, the, the courts to, do, to pursue this. Yes. Um, so with Ghana in this fight, it's it's a it's 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 it's, it's likelihood that Did there is a likelihood that it's going the, to be a success. The report seems to suggest now, more than before, that the Gambia government seems to be willing now. You are talking, you are doubting whether the political will will be there now. Well, you know, Gambia is in a very shoddy political terrain right now, and you don't know. Uh, Politicians are weird animals. They they go into alliances that sometimes so are you so mere yeah. mortals or so no I, people I, I, don't understand. I, 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 so so I, I, I don't talk I, for politicians. But are you suggesting that the uh, Mr. Barrow, um Mr. Barrow will now change or soften his stance when it comes to prosecution or, or backing or supporting moves? Obviously I know um, initiated by the international community to prosecute them. Do you think Mr. Barrow would be unwilling to do that now? Because he's perhaps thinking of um, well, when, when making when, political allies, not wanting to talk to anybody. When I, when I was being tended, Mr. Barrow knew. Yes. So, so you're suggesting that Mr. Barrow can even soften his stance on possible prosecution of Germany because he wants allies now. He's thinking that, of re election, so he doesn't want to talk to anybody. That's about it. Is that what I'm saying? Is that what well, I don't know. You know, um, the thing is, I've come to appreciate uh -huh. that you just don't discard things that are the likelihood of things uh -huh. because you don't find them sensible. Uh -huh. But you are suggesting that um, you, you may not find this logical, but you cannot necessarily say someone else cannot do it. All right. Okay. Yeah. Now. That's about it in the uh, <laughs> newspaper review. I think we will have more of this uh, and get part of it. Thank you very much. Now it's time for Mr. Mustafaki Adawa to tell us what he has on the Ket Fatu website. Okay, thank you very much. I think I would start with um, uh, this is something that <clears throat> had come up. Cham was actually going to speak about it briefly because. I'm not sure it was a newspapers, but I mean, uh, as journalists, this is a discussion that had been among us. Right. Um, we are all aware that the state house had made a telephone conversation with some of our members, the state house press office, indicating that they are having a new policy in place, which requires journalists to go through background checks at uh, NIA. Um, well, they call it SIS. Yeah. It's no. Still NIA. Yeah. That's what the law says. So. Um, so this has caused a lot of controversy. In fact, the International Federation of Journalists has, out a, has put out a press release mm -hmm. yesterday. And what did they say? And they said that they are in, the, because the GPU had put out a media alert yeah. to ask, respectfully ask journalists not to comply with this pending an engagement with the state house. Okay. And I know there is going to be a, an, a, a, an emergency general meeting by all journalists, the GPU members. Uh, the GPU complex at 4.30 today to discuss the issue. Yeah. While that is there, the GPU had, um, uh, the International Federation of Journalists has issued a press release to say that they stand with the GPU in this. In fact, it was almost illogical to ask journalists to um, go and do these background checks. Um, they seem to be um, 
not in line with the view at State House because the view at State House is that this is necessary for security checks. Uh, some one told me uh, this is off the record, though, but it offers us an understanding. Someone told me that um, this is necessary because the securities at State House are not. Some are, most of them are not even Gambian. Mm -hmm. The security situation is not that known. Mm -hmm. But what is strange though, I perhaps I don't know what you think of that, mm -hmm. is that those of us who have applied for State House mm -hmm. accreditation mm -hmm. are actually State House accredited correspondents mm -hmm. before. Before, yeah. Before it expires. Yeah. So I mean the, what the new policy seeks to serve and Well that is the that is the that is the that is where the bone of contention is. Um the Authorities at State House, um, Communication Department, or whoever their advice came from, um, you justify this move to say, okay, this is international standard um, everywhere. Somebody, some if people accredited to State House would have to have some background check to to to, 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 to assess their suitability in terms of security. More importantly, they would stress on security. But what I have observed, and what most people start is that, okay, unless the GPU and this communication staff of the president meet and see exactly what they require people to do, then it is it is obviously safe to say that perhaps this may be an attempt to exclude people or journalists whom they believe perceived to be critical and um, to, 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 to block them from access um, accessing state house. This perhaps let me pick your mind on this too. I mean when Bao came to power um, I have had this argument time and time again, and myself have pulled some of it. When Barrow came to power, one of the things when he, I mean, he promised press freedom. He did not just promise, he delivered press freedom. Um, of course, there are people who say, oh, no, but it's Gambians who change it. But of course, he can also yeah. influence things in some other ways. Yes, yes, he Gambia was here and he did it. Um, but, uh, and that to his credit. Yeah. But what we have seen since the beginning, since the end of 2018, and yeah. the beginning of 2019, mm -hmm. the press conference at State House, which was regularly, which was yeah, regularly, six, six, six monthly, six months, which was weekly, yeah. was taken to two weekly, mm -hmm. bi weekly, yeah. and then was taken to one month, yeah. and then stopped. And now stopped. Stopped. Communicate. Moisi. Ministry of Communication, the same thing. Yeah. Stopped. Stopped. And the various ministries, the kind of engagements they had been having with the media, yeah. stopped. So all the writings are on the wall. That's, uh, and now they appear to be frustrating. And they know, they knew, mm -hmm. from my own analysis, there are media houses that will go for this. Exactly. They so know. they just get their own desirable yeah. journalists yeah, exactly. so that's what I'm saying. To, to attend their press conference. That's, why it's on that, some, that's, that's my that's take. That's why analysts uh, believe that. It is not so much because of security reasons, but an attempt to exclude journalists who might have critical minds and might ask the questions that will inconvenience the president. Perhaps these are the people they want to keep away by going through this process, so that they will pick the ones they think are, are, are really manip manipulative, manipulatable, that is, so that they can. So the whole thing, in my view, is that the GPU, because in the first place, I'm not happy with the manner the, 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 the thing was, in fact, communicated. I thought it would have come with an official policy statement, but then this thing was just thrown at, a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at the GPU said, <laughs> chat or WhatsApp group, and then said, well, okay, if you guys receive telephone calls from the SIS, don't be surprised. It has to be, it has to do with accreditation, etc., etc., which I think is very, very informal for something that as important a policy like this to be communicated through. I, I mean, that was my first misgivings about everything. It should have been officially uh, communicated in an official manner, rather than putting it in a chat group and asking people uh, that they can receive calls from the SIS. I mean, I mean it, was, it was really uh, quite immature in my way to communicate in that way. But then the GPU, like you said, it's good to go and engage them with a standpoint. So the, today's meeting is, is very important. Yeah, so interesting also it's the the gun importation saga. I gotcha. suppose we've not discussed that last yeah, week. Last I think week it, yes. happened. it didn't break at the time. Yeah. Uh, so because it, it turns out that the police have exonerated the gentleman, uh, Mr. Jawara, and the indications are that <coughs> he is found to have not committed any offence. Well, you know, the, for me, my 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 take on this was. Uh, 
It wasn't as if the guns his imported met specifications of his license. Uh, I, I think that was for the law and the police. If that was the basis they arrested him and they tried to prosecute him for, yes, the police are saying that that is no longer the case. The guns uh, he, he, he imported, uh, rather, yes, you know, exported, um, rather imported, were of the specifications according to his license. But my issue is whether these are the speci specifications he, he got licensed for, aren't these guns dangerous or capable enough to take life? That, that's, that's the moral question I ask. If these cracks, if this baby, be they hunting or be they whatever, if they are really guns that can take lives, shall we morally, right, especially given the state of, you know, our stability, our security, allow people to be importing this and then selling it, distributing as widely as possible? Well, that's a question many people ask. This, I think, is what makes the whole matter uh, nonsensical to me. I mean, the guy may import, how to call it, guns that you think are hunting guns, etc. People already have them in their homes, that's fine. But then, we are in a situation where we are always talking that our security is right now. That's why we have foreign troops here. So if we are all aware of that kind of scenario, why would we allow somebody to import guns and sell them and, distrib and distribute them as widely as possible in the name of the fact that this is, is lawful to uh, you know, buy and sell. Uh, I mean, hunting gods, hunting for what? Well, so I think, I think, we don't have animals. So I think, I, I think whether Mister, uh, whether gods have imported, uh, I mean, I mean, uh, whether they've met their requirements, etc. For me, it's, it's all nonsensical. My view is that nobody should be allowed to import a gun into the country where we themselves, ourselves, felt that there is no security yet. So it's for me, it doesn't make any sense that the, the police should come out with this statement and say, okay, for the, for, for the purpose of law, yes, if if the crime that he's been accused of was to import something unlawful, fine, I can understand. But I still think that it's nonsensical and dangerous to allow somebody to import guns, whatever their classifications, if they are capable of taking life, he should not have them in the guns. Okay, That's so we'll point. move on to the final one. I, I hope we have the time to do that. Um, the uh, I mean, we've always talked about migration here in this program, and <clears throat> I mean, there are times in time out when stats would come out to indicate uh, how many Gambians have have gone to Europe, how many Gambians have gone to other countries, but particularly Europe, and how many are facing the potentials of deportation. So, and <clears throat> you know, this Afro barometer report that just all of a sudden comes out last week indicating that actually uh, we have a bit of a problem because six out of every ten Gambians wants to actually leave the country, like desires to leave the country um, for, uh, for other countries. It's interesting though it's saying, it doesn't necessarily say to Europe, but it says yes. must even in fact to African countries, fellow Africans. And it also has to try to specify the reason for that. Absolutely. And in fact, it says also, perhaps we have a bigger problem. And this has been corroborated by the doing the business. Yeah. It says that, in fact, most of these people are already catered class, okay. who likes to immigrate. Yes. So, I mean, I'm, the doing the business index, World Bank report, it says that, of course, Gambia can attract foreign talents, but it cannot keep our own. Okay. It yeah. seems to be a lie. Now, what is tell, tell, tell me, um, I know for a sure that... Um, for, for sure, that uh, uh, there is a born in this uh, Gambia, especially among the youths, to go. Naturally, anyone born, including you, to England, never. But I have, been, I've, unlike you and me, I've been to, I've been to many places, but I never had or developed intention to stay permanently or for a long time in UK or anywhere ever I went to. But I'm telling you that anyone born from the late nineties right down here or perhaps even a little earlier, have been born with the mentality that the only way to succeed in life here as fast as I would like is to leave the country. No matter how prospective... And then come back later perhaps. Yes, they come back later. Okay, everybody wants to come back here. Yeah, that, that one is true. They always want to come back. But they don't want to be sent back. Exactly. They want to be sent back before they are planning, intended to travel. So, intended to return. So, 
I believe this is, uh, is, is now a big obsession for people who were born, you know, in the late 80s up to now. Everyone is born with the mentality that the only way to really make it in life is to go to Europe and later come back. So no matter how prospect, you know, we have seen musicians who could have made a lot of money here if they had stayed here. But they felt that things are slow here. They went to Europe and somehow to leave their professions and went to do something else and became something else. But so this, this is a mentality and I think the Afro barometer is right in such a way that the majority of the people, especially youths, actually don't want to be told that there can be prospects here for them to make it in life. They don't want to hear it. What they want to do is jump on the plane, go to Europe, whatever they find there, fine, is their fate. Isn't it, doesn't it present a bigger challenge? I mean, Gambia can only be developed by Gambians. Exactly. I mean, and if you look at the proportion, the population to the proportion of those who are going, you find out that for a small community like ours, I mean, it's tragic that the majority of us want to go away, at least for some time, and come back. Uh, well, the, the gap, the, the absence, the, the, the time they will spend away, and of course their absence here would mean that the country will really, really suffer in terms of development, in, you know, and in terms of um, whatever you call it, until they return. But then of course the mentality at the back of the mind, when I return, there will be more story buildings, there will be flashy cars, so it's what well, the remittances is 20 billion dollars, don't forget that. That's, that's, that's so so thank, thank you very you much. Thank you very much just to tell you it's like me that look we can make it in Gambia I've schooled in Gambia I've done everything in Gambia and today I have no regret oh. let's just start appreciating what we have as Gambians because nobody would leave their countries to come and invest in our country and make our country a safer heaven that we would want now to one of my favorite 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 um segments that is the entrepreneur every week we in of course um profile a gambian who has set up a business for economic growth and employment creation in this edition we meet two young entrepreneurs they go by the name hatim jai and um fatu bajan they both own and manage jollof bites they offer catering services for all types of events and also have an outlet at the University of the Gambia. Let's take a look. Um, my name is Hatim Jai. Um, I am the co-owner of Jollof Bites. Um, my name is Safi Bajan, the co-owner of Jollof Bites restaurant and catering business. Cool. Um, the business, we started it um, two years back. So, um, like, she's a good cook and friends and family used to um, order things from her. So we wanted to make it more formal. So, um, so we formed uh, partnership business and we named it Joll of Bites. So we were doing catering service for um, the families like um, naming ceremonies and weddings. Um, but afterwards we started getting orders from um, workshops, um, seminars and conferences. So uh, we decided to um, register the business, uh, the business with the GRA um, and we already have a license from the Food and Safety Authority. So. That's how we started. For me, um, it's like a passion. Cooking is a passion for me. It's something that comes out natural in me. And it's something that I really love. And I said, why not put my passion into working and then start my uh, my own business? And he was also willing to like start the business. And that's how John of Bites came to be. And that's how it started. Uh, we prepare almost all of the dishes, but mainly Gambian dishes also. Uh, we have like meat pies, sausage rolls, spring rolls. We do our local ebe. We cook all kind of Gambian dishes too. And we also do the chicken, the grilled chicken, the fried chicken in breadcrumb, and different kind of dishes. And also our cow food, um, um, cassava and beans, locally called nyambe nyebe and fry. We do different kind of dishes. We do almost all of the dishes. Mm. 
um, I guess mainly um, financial challenges um, because um, maybe sometimes when we have order a large order, um, we have to buy um, the materials and ingre uh, ingredients to cater for for a large event. So we have financial challenges sometimes, but um, I guess we are, we are managing. I'm currently two, two, we have two employees. Um, currently our clients are, because we currently have one adult at the university, so our clients are mostly students, people working, a working class, students, and we also have these corporate bodies coming in to order for their seminars and workshops and different kind of stuff. We're open to everyone though. Different age, um, the age and different generations, like we're open to everybody. Um, I guess in the next five years, we want to open um, a lot of outlets around the greater Banjul area as much as we can. And we want to provide food, ready food for the working class people and for schools as going students. We want to make food um, easily accessed by the masses. That's our plan. Uh, we want to be the leading catering company in the Gambia, inshallah. The name of the business is Jollof Bites. Jollof as in Senegambi and Bites as in bits and pieces of food. That you eat and that you get eat. the feeling of eating. Yeah. It's something that like brings life to you when you eat. Something that just like, um, I don't know how to explain, just something that gives you pleasure when you eat. Um, currently, we have an outlet at the University of the Gambia um, Law School um, campus next to GRTS. Um, yeah, that's where we're located at the moment. Um, telephone numbers 394-6256 and 311-4708. Um, 394-6256 and 311-4708. just want everyone to know that we are open to the entire public, the entire uh, Gambia for support. Um, we urge everyone to come and support us since we are young entrepreneurs just coming up and we need as much support that we can get from the Gambians. One thing I can guarantee is when you visit our stores or uh, eat any of our foods, what is guaranteed is a, di a different taste, different from whatever you have ever tasted, the best food ever that you will ever taste. So. That's it. That's well of bites. It's always a difference from the other, all the other available foods. I just want to add that uh, we the the trade fair is starting on the sixth of April, and we're having a store there, at the a stall there at the youth pavilion. So anybody coming to the trade fair can visit us there. Thank you.
Welcome back after that uh, short video of Hatib, Jai and Fatima. Of course, they are entrepreneurs. Let's endeavor to support young entrepreneurs, especially university students that are, you know, trying to add enough to the GDP of the nation. So to the special guest. Our special guest for today is Mr. Ablai Kurang. He's a lecturer at the University of the Gambia. He lectures development studies and public policy. Today he joins us. He, he has already joined. He's in the studio already. And uh, we'll briefly talk about the presentation report of the Jani Commission and other institutional lapses from Jamis era and where you think we'll be heading at. Welcome, Mr. Uh, Kurang. Yes, thank you so much, um, Kelfado, for actually inviting me. And um, yes, the reports emerging from the the OCCRP, mm -hmm. that is Organization for Organized no, Organized Crime Project. Project, sort of, yeah. And I think the report is the the findings of the reports are overwhelming. People are really shocked, considering the kind of. Uh, resource mismanagement that has been done by the, the former government, precisely Yaya Jame. I mean, we are talking about billions of dollars, not just in dollars, but dollars, you know. And you realize that the Gambia could have better used such resources to change the well-being of a very small country. Looking at the Gambia, you realize that we are really small and the resources that have been plundered, that have been wasted by Jame in many, many irrelevant activities could have actually bettered the health sector of the country, could have also improved the educational standard of the Gambia, could have also improved the living standard, the income of individuals of Gambians. Just recently, I've been looking at the, the HDI, that is the Human Development Index of the Gambia, and you look at the ranking of the country, you realize that the Gambia still performs very, very poorly in the Human Development Index. The Gambia ranks 174 out of 189 countries and territories. This shows you that the Gambia is one of the poorest countries on, on earth. But how did this occur? Before we talk about averting such institutional crisis, such resource mismanagement, we have to first look back and look at the, the failures that occurred in our institutions. How can we avoid this? Okay. And I believe this institutional crisis did not just occur in a vacuum and it did not just occur overnight. But these are structural problems that we are, that we are long-standing. You know? And these were structural problems that were embedded in the days of Jawara. And such structural problems were further consolidated by Jame when he came to power. Because Jame, when he came to power, he gave us a very big promise. That is, he's here, he's, uh, here to make sure that he changes the inefficiency and the corrupt government of Jawara. But Jame came to power to further consolidate corruption, inefficiency, and actually supplemented it with, with tyranny. Okay? And... In this sense, Jame could only achieve such goals by making sure that he controls every institution in the country. Let, let's, so, let's particularly look at, confine ourselves to those institutions that yeah. we here. I mean, if you look at the, the great Gambia heist and yeah. the Jane Commission, um, before we get to their findings, mm -hmm. and at the heart of all this financial mismanagement and grant terms, Mm -hmm. is institutions, like how they were mismanaged. But these institutions were in fact also headed by Gambians. And there are laws, financial regulations, there mm -hmm. are acts mm -hmm. that are supposed to go govern their affairs. How, mm -hmm. how did he manage to do that? I mean, <laughs> people are supposed to be guided by something. Yeah, but, but this is what we say. That is, Jamia was a totalitarian. And in a totalitarian system of government, Legislations do not matter. People do not matter. Because Jame was surrounding himself with close allies. People that he can use to plunder our resources. People that he can use to further entrench himself in power. Okay? So all of this legislation, talking about, let's say, in, you know, in the constitution of the Gambia, you learn that there are clear separation of powers. You know, all of these things have been clearly stated out. That is, 
the executive should be checked by the, the, the judiciary and also the legislature. You know, this separation of powers are clearly evident. That never okay? But what Jame did was trying to make sure that he corrupt all of these, these branches to make sure that he feels all these powers to himself. Which he did. Okay? Do you feel yeah. they have played a part? Say, for instance, if he sends Seoul Baji to Central Bank Government yeah. and say, yeah. give me 20 million, yeah. even when that does not necessarily go with the rules. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, no. Because he says, if I don't do this, I'm yeah. going to die. Yeah, but Jame, we should also understand that Jame was not always using the stick, but he was also giving out the carrot. Yeah. That is, if you are he my good, good boy, I, I give you incentives. I and if you fail to be my good boy, I mean, I punish you. Yeah. That is, I... I, I incarcerate you or I mean I torture you so the guy is a very big tactic he is just very smart I I because Jame was able to manipulate very very brilliant people people that we see as very but sober intellectuals don't you think he managed to achieve this by because he instilled uh, terror in the minds of the people and he always had a, a brutal force to, to rely on to execute his uh, evil um, deeds. That's why people got scared and found it powerless to mm -hmm. say, to yeah. speak, to yeah. defy him. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and terror was his biggest weapon. Yeah. You know, and even like, even in his developmental, like decentralization, like Jami was bringing development to people based on your political affiliation. Absolutely. That is, if you're in support of the APRC government, he, he provides you with already. development. And considering that, okay, people are hungry, they are tired. They are just left with no choice but to align themselves to the, to the, to the, to the, to the APRC agenda yeah. during the days of Jame. Yeah. Because they needed this development so badly. Yeah. For example, look at certain regions in the country, like Kiang area. Like, Kiang yeah. for long has been marginalized Absolutely. because of their stronghold mm -hmm. criticisms, their stronghold opposition. To Jame. So, I mean, these are all tactics that he was using. That is why strategic voting was very, very high in the Gambia's electoral system. Strategic voting in the sense that people knew that if they do not vote for APRC, yeah. he's going to deny them of incentive, development incentives. Yeah. In fact, so people had to vote for him so that they enjoy these developmental in fact, benefits. Not to, not to interrupt you, yeah. uh, and even during the, even before the elect last election results were declared yeah. fully, I, I have no true source that there are certain areas in the country when yeah. their results were announced and the opposition seemed to have done very well there. Yeah. The local authorities uh, yeah. actually began to panic. And, oh, yeah. we, we are finished. This <laughs> yeah. Little did they know that after all over all this country, yeah. this country yeah. Jambi wouldn't be a problem anymore. Yeah. So you, know, you are right in that way. He will yeah. look at the totality of the votes. Yeah. And look at the areas where he scored most and say, ah, you people want development. Yeah, well, perhaps let's look, also look at the social mm -hmm. psyche of the Gambian person. Like, yeah. uh, our understanding of power and uh, yeah. submission, natural tendency to submit to power. Mm -hmm. Is there also a problem? Like, my father, for instance, mm -hmm. would tell me, al like, like, <laughs> But I, I think... So, so, you know, I mean... Yeah. But it, it all has to do with our political our level of political awareness. Because in a society whereby there is low political awareness and political awareness come can come can only come through critical education. Not just education, but critical education. That is what is going to give people a broader perspective and critical I mean part on, on how to how to engage in politics. And this has been a problem in the Gambia. So you talk to the ordinary Gambian. You know, they, the way they exercise their political right is quite interesting, you know. But in a society whereby education is very, very strong, critical education is strong, mm -hmm. you learn that people tend to align themselves to political parties based on the policies and programs that they sell to them. Yeah. But in a society whereby education is very low, no. you learn that people tend to align themselves to political parties based on cultural ties, mm -hmm. based on identities. Identity. So, I mean, I do not actually blame the ordinary Gambians for certain things, but it's our responsibility, our responsibility as intellectuals and also for the government to build strong institutions that would enhance the, the awareness, the critical awareness of, of, of Gambians. Mm -hmm. Just look at this, this is also evident in, in certain societies. You look at the, the writings of uh, Paulo Freire and many critical developmental theorists, they would tell you that 
critical education is a precondition for the development of any society. It's, it's a precondition for political participation and it's a precondition to hold also leaders into, into account. Okay. But do you think, uh, was there ever a leadership that can inspire in the Gambia this kind of uh, education? Yes. Did we ever have it? Recently, one National Assembly member controversially said yeah. the country had never had a good leadership. I think the Gambia has really been unfortunate over the years. Like to be to be to be very uh, uh, blunt about it. Like we have been very unfortunate over the years because we had Jam like we had Jawara for thirty years, and Jawara's Jawara was not repressive, like he was not brutal, but Jawara was unable to tackle these two very prominent crisis during this era that is corruption and inefficiency in, in our public institution and Jame came to power also thinking that Gambians thinking that okay now Jame is going to salve us he's going to give us uh, the good life that we have been yearning for Jame was also unable he further even entrenched corruption and inefficiency in our public institution because Jame's uh, appointment basically was on, 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 on clientele, patron, patron, patronage based clientele, that is making so that he appoint individuals based on the, their, their, their alignment to the, to the APRC party and also based on the relationship that they have. And further went on to add repression on it. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I can say over the years we have been very unfortunate since the dawn of colonialism. Now, now uh, giving all this into consideration, one would have thought that Mr. Barrow who succeeded these two yeah. governments, uh, mm -hmm. about which you have misgivings, yeah. Mr. Barrow would have the, the, the ample opportunity to mm -hmm. rectify all these things and inspire the country to have all these values mm -hmm. in place. Yeah. How has he performed in this direction for you? <laughs> okay, and this is a very interesting question and I think it's timely. I, you know Gambians, we, we are really optimistic. That is what led to the, to the removal of Jame. For I personally, I have never been this actively involved in politics until December 2016. That is when I felt that, okay, it's time. And many young people also got involved in politics because they felt that actually they are tired and their destiny is really, uh, is really dark. So they needed this, this, this change, you know. But I can say, Baro. You know, he made some, the coalition made some promises and Barrow also made some promises that is to, to build the building blocks of democracy. That is to establish these commissions. That is the Jane Commission, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the Constitutional Review Commission. Okay. But these commissions have been established. I mean, they, they are working, you know. But it's one thing also having these commissions working. But whether the recommendations coming from the commission are going to be actually adhered to. That's where we're coming. And also, uh, whether Barrow is going to be different from Jame in and Jawara in terms of inefficiency and co in tackling corruption. Because I haven't seen also significant changes in, in our institutional structures. Because it's still the same bureaucracy, the same red tape. And in any institution where bureaucracy is deeply entrenched, that institution is likely to be very corrupt because people want services to be there. and I haven't seen just remarkable changes that would give me the confidence that the Gambia is, 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 is making substantive progress because you look at the Gambia since the 1990s like our income hasn't changed it has been more or less static you look at the HDI report the income of Gambians has barely changed you talk to many Gambians, they will tell you that, okay, now we are getting more dollars. But it's not about the, the amount of dollars you're getting right. at the end of the month, but it's based on the purchasing power parity. Yeah. You look at the education, though there is increased enrollment in primary, secondary, and even in tertiary education, gender parity also, substantive progress has been made in that sense. But we're talking about quality and relevant education. It's not about the quantity of people that we have in our schools. Wow. But to what extent is our education, right. the quality is there, and how relevant is it to our local development needs? Because we are not just getting the knowledge to be, to be intellectuals mm -hmm. independently of the society, but our knowledge should be applicable and with regards to solving our development challenges. So and also the health sector, I mean, the life expectancy of yes. the Gambians. I mean, 
the life expectancy of Gambians is 61 years. That is, that is really bad, you know. So, I mean, the, the health sector is, is, is really not, I mean, so, so I mean the, developing. So, some of you think you have not seen tangible, very clear indicators that Mr. Barrow's regime could actually uh, have inspired the country to achieve all these things we missed out on Mr. Jawara and Mr. Jammes' time. Yes, uh, yeah. yeah, I well, haven't well, definitely seen any, so, so any clear is, indicator. Yeah, yeah. in this sense. Based on the Commission of Inquiries, that's what we are coming to the Jali yeah. Commission have just submitted yeah. their report. Yeah. And according to the Minister of Justice, yeah. who touched surveys of it, that yeah. Mr. Jambi particularly, have been discovered to have uh, stolen a lot of money. A lot of money, in his, yeah. words, in his words, financial delinquents. Of the form of delinquency of the former president. Yeah. Megalomaniac, actually. Yeah. yeah, megalomaniac, he said. <laughs> now, you mentioned something very important because, yeah. and even despite the fact that the president has said the Ministry of Justice should quickly review this so that necessary actions should be taken, Take it, yeah. you want to say that even with that assurance, you think the president will not have the political will to implement whatever uh, recommendations are. Do you think he will gamble? ignore these recommendations uh, just because he wants political power and so he wants to run for office and he doesn't want to hurt any side, he wants an alliance. But that's what the critics said he might end up doing. You think he will go that way? Yeah, I think this would also remind me of the argument that is technicality versus politics. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, Gambia, likewise many African countries, we do not have problems with regards to technical papers, but implementing them, mm -hmm. moving them to action. And the recommendations, I'm pretty sure they are quite powerful recommendations that would also strengthen the institutions of the Gambia. Mm -hmm. But you like that politics, the way we do politics in Africa can be quite unhealthy. It clouds our judgments, yes. you know. And our leaders can be so much focused on entrenching themselves in power, you know. And with all indications, mm -hmm. Baro is, is moving towards that, that direction mm -hmm. because just with the establishment of the borough youth movement, mm -hmm. that's, that has really, I mean, shocked me in, I, as, as, I as an intellectual because I was expecting borough to be totally different from Jambi. Okay. But with the, what is the sole purpose of the borough youth movement? Well, he, he uh, to be fair with them, they, don't, they said it's not a movement, they said it's borough. Even for national development. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> then the moment, it should not, oh my. I think, I mean, we should just be serious about these things. We should be serious about our development and let's just leave politics out of it. You know, we need those leaders, leaders that are developmental, that are, that, that put the nation ahead of the personal interest. And this, this is the problem and, now. Okay, you said from You are just singing the president's song. From, from, from the formation <laughs> of the Friday, he said exactly yeah. that. On Thursday, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah. from, the, from, the, from the onset, when you see this BYN and DP or whatever it's yeah. called, you knew perhaps, you suspected the president is really going to be somebody who is going to entrench himself Self, in yeah. power. Yeah, I suspected Didn't that. Didn't you yeah. see other adequate uh, evidence mm -hmm. and the fact that he has he, he had the courage to fall out with everybody, mm -hmm. um, allegedly because of his ambition to stay in power. I mean, if you ask uh, the, the DOI uh, uh, coalition partners, they would say, well, we mm -hmm. think that he should morally abide by the three years agreement. Yeah. OJ was far more blunt and categorical that yeah. he would not even pass three years, whether he's in office or not, he knows that was what we discussed. Yeah. But uh, Tambaja once said that it was three years that they agreed, yeah. even though she would like them yeah. to go back. Yeah. Dawa and others, the UDP who actually initially sympathized in mm -hmm. five, five years, five years. Don't seem to have appetite. Don't seem, one don't one seem to have appetite for yeah. of, 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 to stay on that list. And allegedly they fell out because yeah. he said they were undermining his national agenda. Yeah. But they said he that national agenda is, yeah. is masqueraded with yeah. politics. Mm -hmm. So he, he can afford to fall out with all these people because he wants to enter in power, enter in power. Yeah. You believe he will sacrifice and throw away all these recommendations because he wouldn't like to hurt the people. <laughs> Faraba is perhaps our starting point, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the Faraba Commission. Uh, yeah, Faraba Commission. You show the how actually how how yeah how, how, how in, in dif uh, I mean I wouldn't say he was indifferent about it, but I think we should just avoid the problem of soft state syndrome. 
and soft state syndrome in the sense that the state cannot take action on certain things. Because in the Faraba incident, like you said, a precedence has been set there. And we have seen the incident in, in Gunjur also. This is to tell people that, okay, you can actually commit heinous crimes and go and, and just come to the president and beg him and then he will let you go free, scot free. You see what I learned from the Faraba incident, the press release or whatever, um, it doesn't matter whether the right institution is or yes. but what it conveyed to me is what exactly the intention of the regime was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, so but, but do we fear that this kind of thing can happen again? I mean, the, the, the deluge of reaction and condemnation mm -hmm. uh, actually made the government to change this position. So they're doing and but they're the initial doing intention yeah. uh, have, 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 is already conveyed. That is, Barrow yeah. wanted to treat this matter in a way that he thinks he can. All parties will, all be, parties happy. will be happy. Even though but people are crying that justice yeah. is not served by that. Yeah, but I, you know, also, Gambia, we have a culture, and that culture of forgiving and the like. You know that all that is also uh, deeply part of us but i think as a leader you know we need to be firm on certain things i'm not saying that Barrow should be should be repressive you know should be brutal as a leader but i'm saying that he should be firm on certain things you know take strict measures on certain things because you know we are guided by laws as a nation and when we do not respect laws we would become anarchic in, in nature. So I think these are important things, you know, but also just make sure that people do not just do things like we are living in a lawless country. We should just make sure that the law is applied. Let, let me give you, you know? let me give you a, a rundown on some few basic things. Um, difficult decisions. Um, uh, when Barrow came, one of the promises he has made was the vehicle policy. Yeah. And then he did that, and then apparently, after so much noise, the government appeared to have taken you to. Mm -hmm. And then also, the issue of Faraba Commission came. The government started and investigations, recommendations for uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, prosecution. Mm -hmm. Then the government is in action again. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. so there is at least a trend of. But was inability to, to take that you mean kind of difficult syndrome. decisions and, yeah. and and hold on to it. And the Commission, a lot of people suspect, may in fact recommend that certain people who are adverse adversely Property, mentioned yeah. to have been involved mm -hmm. in certain financial misappropriations or aiding Jambe to conduct certain institutional financial misappropriations. Mm -hmm may be actually banned from holding public office. And yeah. you've seen... Some uh, people are former, still in the system. You've seen former mm -hmm. budget uh, budget officials, uh, now BYM, and former <laughs> yeah. SGs, now BYM. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. BYMD. <laughs> but are you different for national level? So, okay. so, yeah, so do you... I mean, isn't there, isn't there a bit of a... Can anybody... Isn't there a logic in this thinking that the recommendations may also be made and unmade. Undone <laughs> 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 and undone. <laughs> yeah, we, we are seeing a very clear pattern. I think um, here, yeah, the government has been very soft with regards to the recommendations arising from the different activities that have been undertaken. You know, And this has also made me uh, quite pessimistic with regards to the recommendations emerging from the Janet Commission. So I believe as a country, if we are to make an impact, we should be able to move the things that are written in, in, in black and white into action. Mm -hmm. But if, what's the essence of having all these commissions if we are not abiding by the, the recommendations of the commission? Now, take, Why? take it by People, analysts said all this is happening. We are having doubts as to whether these transitional programs will be implemented the fullest. Yeah. Because the transitional agenda, which also includes yeah. a transitional president, mm -hmm. huh, yeah. is now being uh, thrown, thrown away. That is why, for example, to put it just in simple terms, yeah. if Mr. Barrow had 
not develop political ambitions and only confine himself to be a consistent so president, president yeah. who will come out to do reforms. Yeah. Which are probably yeah. nobody will doubt. Yeah. Nobody will he'll doubt. Will yeah. doubt yeah. Will His intentions, yeah, actually. So, so yeah. That's the kind of picture. I have. think that's also where the problem began because, you know, like politicians would always look for ways to justify their they are state in power and Baro in this sense was was justifying his stay based on the constitution. You know, that is the constitution gives certain provisions that is five years and okay. the coalition. No, 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 probably you are talking about the three years. That, that's all, that's already out of the picture. I mean yeah. people who no, but, have Mr. Barrow is not talking about beyond even these five years we're talking about. Yeah, but that's where I'm coming from. Yeah. Like, you know, first is the issue of morality, you know. Yeah. Because it is moral when you make an agreement with someone to honor it, you know. And since Barrow now has forfeited that, saying that, I mean, he's going to abide by the constitution. But there's a thin line between constitutionality and, and also morality. Okay, okay. Let me, let, so, me, let me, because we have three minutes, so I want us to talk about this. Yeah. Now, moving forward, mm -hmm. um, we know that this report has been presented, the recommendations whether Barrow will, will, yeah. will or will not. Yeah. But the lessons in the past have been learned because we've listened to journal commissions and all that yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. In some of the institutions that have served as a conduit for corruption is, is these uh, back way ways of doing things. Like uh, mm -hmm. Baro has also started donating vehicles that yeah. apparently comes from someone we don't know. And he's done he that has set up a youth movement. Yeah. They, uh, I mean, are we, are we having a break with the past? That's why I said, I mean, I'm not very optimistic considering the current trend, you know. Because Jami was doing that. Like he was giving out cars, throwing cars to people, you know, giving vehicles, doing things out of his budget. Because, I mean, you cannot be that rich as a country. And when you are the, the president of a particular country, when resources are being given to you, it's for the state, you know. So I cannot just imagine Baro being that rich overnight. I mean, it's less than, I mean, it's just two years. 52 you know? vehicles, if yeah, it costs I mean, 2 million, is over 100 million. So, 57 vehicles. I mean, where is yeah. he getting those resources from? We need to have that transparency in the system. The National Assembly members, <laughs> you know? give them 10,000. Well, the boss is about to yeah. just... Yeah. Thank you very <laughs> much. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's been wonderful having you, Mr. Ablai Kurang, on the yeah. show. And you've definitely exhibited that you are an intellectual. Mm -hmm. And this is what we expect from uh, an intellectual, especially you educating uh, most of our youngsters in the University of the Gambia. But before we take a leave of you, we want you to tell us Say your last words or your recommendation to the government, having discoursed um, from the post jami era to where we are right now. Yeah. I think my strongest recommendation would be for the government to still work on building the institutions. Because without institutional development, we cannot actually develop as a country. Let's say if the tax collecting institutions are not strong, taxes are going to leak out into the pockets of few individuals in the country. If our institutions are still not strong, the resources that we get from foreign aid and so on are going to leak into, into the pockets of uh, a few individuals or they are going to be misappropriately used. So we need to have strong institutions. And in this sense, we cannot also build these strong institutions overnight, but we can start the work now. You know, The government can start by making so that he appoints the right people in, in, in I mean, let's, let's just forgo the politics. Let's look beyond the politics. Let's appoint people based on their competence, based on their credentials. I mean, this is how we can have the institutional capacity that we need for our national development. And also, let's look back. Let's also try to look ahead. That is the sustainability part of it. Let's try to invest in our education. Let's try to review the educational policy, educational system, make it more quality and relevant. With this, we'll be able to have the right people to man our public offices in the long run. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Blai Kurang. Gambia, you've heard it. He said in order for the government to grow, um, there is a need for institutional development, sustainability, and more quality education in order for us to move from the stage we at to a more progressive state. Thank you so much, Mr. Kurang, for joining us. Yeah. Um, before we leave the studio, I would like 
my fellow panelists to give us our final words. And of course, next would be the hot spot of the week. Mr. Lamin Cham. Well, I am hoping that uh, at least something will be had uh, about the Jana Commission and its recommendations. That's its recommendations, although I know it, this, at the moment the review and every process has been kept tight and secret, but I hope somebody somewhere will drop some leakages to us so that we can serve the public. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I know the review will be out. I, I somehow trust the, I, I trust the Justice Minister. Just this yeah. sense of professionalism. I know the report will be out. Yeah. It will be reviewed and it will One be way the other. So whether the president will do it and will do it, we don't know that. <laughs> so <laughs> I hope the action and inaction doesn't repeat itself again. So have a pleasant yeah. weekend. Yeah. Before we take a leave of you, I just want to remind you that the brunch show is definitely open for sponsorship. And of course, we would not do justice if we do not thank EJ Investment for always believing in a brunch. Not just the brunch, Kerfatu as well. So if you want to see this show continue, I know most of you out there say, ah, the brunch is my favorite show. You know, sometimes there is cost attached to whatever that you enjoy. So please uh, kindly write to us on social media, Facebook, of course, or you can, um, at the end of the day, I'm sure that we'll have our numbers been uh, placed. Just try and support your very own brunch show because it's almost a year now and we definitely need your support. On behalf of the Kerfato team and of course the brunch team, we wish you the best of the weekend. My name is uh, Farmer Sanya. I'm the general manager of uh, Alibaba restaurant, Bruce Ubi, Tuan Table. Uh, the service we have here, we do serve uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah. Uh, if people who want to have their breakfast here, yeah, we do serve breakfast and we do serve English breakfast. We have English breakfast, we have continental breakfast. And uh, we have, we serve lunch and dinner. Yeah. Okay, our menu, we have different uh, food items. We have uh, Gambian local dish, special ones, and uh, we have uh, European dish also in the menu. So. It's left to the customer when you come to the restaurant now. Uh, if you uh, no need to request the menu, I have my waiters and the waitress been ready for the customers here. So when you arrive any type of food you request for, we will make it for you. And we always have uh, been ready here. For the first time, um, we do have breakfast. You know, some people, they, some of the people, they like uh, English breakfast or they want uh, just continental breakfast. Serve with coffee or tea or black coffee or black tea, whatever you want. And uh, also, like, uh, we do serve uh, shawarma also. Some of people, they want, uh, like, uh, quick food, like uh, the one we already made uh, is already there, like shawarma and we meat pie and we do serve our stuff meat pie also yeah most of our customer people like our meat pie special for the breakfast our menu it's a very nice menu. The selection of my, our menu is very beautiful. Because uh, some of the guests, when they come here, 
when they see our menu, they will say, oh, okay, I went to other place, but your menu is more selective than their menu. What you have in your menu is very nice, and to be honest with you. So, especially like uh, our shawarma, people like our shawarma too much. And our meat pie also, people like our meat pie, especially like the stuffed meat pie. What we stuff in, like, uh, we normally stuff uh, beef, shrimp, chicken, yeah. And normal meat pie as uh, the one with uh, only we will put all only minced meat there, because uh, the size of meat pie anyway is very good. People like it, yeah. And we are selling it for reason a very reasonable prices. Uh, yeah, normally we don't go out for the catering, but uh, we do have birthday party here. Like uh, if people wants to do your birthday here, we always uh, do it. Uh, uh, 20 people or 25 people, up to 50 people. Yeah, we do cater for the, uh, the, the, the birthday party also. Yeah, we do have a uh, cake or birthday cake. We have a very nice birthday cake whereby a lot of people are really like it and they are very reasonable prices. Yeah. So. We located at uh, Bruce B. Tone Table, just right uh, opposite uh, LG. Yeah. We, our service number is uh, 7171711. It's a very nice uh, number. 7171711. Seven zero seven zero seven zero zero seven zero seven zero seven zero zero. Yeah, it's the number to call if you want to make uh, like a uh, food order before you hear. Yeah. I will first of all thank our customer, main, uh, those our uh, regular customer have always been here. I will say I'm very happy about your coming and I think uh, we also appreciate for your coming and thank you very much for your coming to Alibaba restaurant, Bruce B. Tone Table. Uh, what I want from you people also, we are here to satisfy our customers, any level you are. So we are only here. Anything you, anything border you in the restaurant, as far as you are in Alibaba restaurant, anything border you, please, you welcome at any time. You can come over and explain to us and we will do our best to solve your problem. That's why we are here. Yeah. Alibaba restaurant is the hottest restaurant in town so far. Alibaba restaurant in Tone Table is the hottest restaurant in town. Dreaming of owning a property in a prime location with great proximity and fantastic neighborhood? EJ Investments Sanyang Seaview Estate is the best choice you have been waiting for. Our Sanyang Seaview Estate is approximately 15 minutes drive away from the busy hop of Brusubi roundabout and into the heart of nature where you can have a peaceful and relaxed lifestyle with your family. You can buy a finished four bedroom story with five year flexible payment plan or a service plot with two year payment plan 
option. With over 300 homes, you'll enjoy big tar roads with covered drainage, modern electrification with solar street lights, gated entrance with security post, and a breath-catching experience of our beautiful sea view and lake view. You can own a home today at our Sanyang Sea View Estate. Call us today on 446-4838 or 325-9220. Visit our website on ejinvestments.net. EJ Investments, first in property.